Hi, my name is Chris. I'm with Click Team, the developers of Click Team Fusion 2.5. I am a uh, myself. I'm a indie developer for 17 years, and I've only used Fusion. Uh, I was invited today to go ahead and show you how to make some games. So I think we'll start by just giving you the most basic demo of Fusion. This is the same demo we give in trade shows. It takes about two to three minutes. And then after that, we'll maybe answer some questions, and then uh, we'll talk about what kind of game we want to try to work together on for the rest of the time. So if that sounds good, give me a, some texts showing me that that sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen. If I can figure out how to operate this thing. Here we go. Sharing a screen. Hey, look, there's my name. It's two Ps in operations, though, so let's, uh, let's watch out for that. All right. So I've shared my screen. That's that's we're halfway there. Okay, so for all of you that uh, are going to try to do this with me, I'd like you to go ahead and uh, boot Fusion. And it should look something like this by the time you boot it up. Uh, if it's your first time installing it, you may be missing a couple windows or toolbars, as we call them. We have the workspace toolbar up here, the properties toolbar here. And because the very first one is going to be uh, something we use from library graphics, you need the library toolbar. If any of these toolbars are missing, just go to View, Toolbars, and click whatever one you want to put up there. Again, I recommend the workspace, the properties, and the library toolbar for this first portion of the, the demonstration. So without further ado, we're going to start the demonstration. Now, what everyone needs to do at first, okay, is click File, New. We did a study, and 98% of our users make it this far. Now, if you guys, uh, some of you are in that 2% and can't figure out File, New, it's probably time to go ahead and close Fusion and just move along. But for the other 98% of you, we're going to continue on. Great job, GGDA. So now what happened is when I hit File, New, I created a new application, and I populated the first editor, which is right here, which we call the Storyboard Editor. And you can access the storyboard editor from anywhere in Fusion by clicking on that button. The storyboard editor uh, shows you all your frames. Fusion programs can be broken up into frames when working in the editor. The nomenclature for that is you could have a title frame. You could have a credits frame. You could have an options frame. You could have a level frame or an engine frame or multiple level frames, depending on how you design your app. Uh, for this demonstration, we're going to build the most basic game. And in starting to do that, we have to go to the next editor. So we do that by clicking one, which is right here. And that brings us to our first major editor, the frame editor. The frame editor, for those of you that are not much into programming, is uh, basically the theater of your application. The dotted white space here is our stage. And that's what we'll see when we run the game. The dark gray area is backstage. That's where we're going to put items or objects that are in the application that are going to be pulled in visually later or uh, are uh, not or, or function in the background, like a mathematical object or some sort of function that uh, doesn't need to be visually seen. Objects uh, Fusion is an object-oriented uh, language. And uh, did, did you blow it up, Zap Mill? What, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? Uh, I, okay, well, that's okay. I, maybe maybe if I do good enough this particular demo, I will have earned full screen next time. Um, okay. Um, so anyways, I'm going to insert an object just to show you the object dialog. Uh, this particular version of Fusion is pretty standard and has uh, very few extra objects, but these represent some of the objects, each object having a different function. Um, for the demonstration that we're going to do, we're going to only work with two objects, what we call the active object, which in uh, programming speak uh, would be a sprite, uh, and a background object, which you know, oddly enough is just a background image. So, but this is where you would grab new objects, default set, set versions of those objects. So if I wanted to get a default sprite, I'd double click active and drop it in here, and I have an active. Uh, again, an active equals sprite. And when I double click it, that's where I can import images and make animations and all that good stuff. But to move things along, uh, we're going to use 
predefined objects. So we're going to grab our first background object, which is this really pretty sky. This particular background object is a quick background object, and we can change colors in the gradient to whatever we want simply by clicking some options. Now I've made it ugly. So I'll try to de-ugly it. And then I'm going to grab our first sprite. I'm going to grab the mallow one. If you're doing it along with me, you can grab whichever brick you want. I just prefer the word mallow for some reason, so I'm going to go with it. And then I'm going to grab a, a ball object. You can go with gold or silver. You know, we do give you options. And then finally, you need the player. So now I've put in a total of four objects, three active objects and one background object. Now you notice in the side of the frame editor, we have a one-to-one -one relationship with our objects. We have a ball, the player, the sky, the mallow, and they all correspond. Now we did another study years ago, and what came out of the study is we determined that games with one brick tend to suck. So we're going to go ahead and make multiple bricks. We're going to do that by duplicating the one brick that we have. So I'm going to say six rows, 12 columns. You put in what you want. That gives me this. Now notice, for those that are not familiar with programming, I have all these new bricks, but I still only have one over here. That's because these are multiple instances of the same object. If you have, don't have any experience in programming, that will make more sense to you when we actually start writing code, or as we like to call them, events. Now, uh, my OCD is being activated, so I need to go ahead and align these to the center. Now I feel a little better. Now, if you notice, over here we have the Properties tab. I get a lot of work done just by manipulating properties in Fusion. The first property I'm going to manipulate is the movement property for the two objects that need to move. I want to start with our player, and we're going to go to the Movement tab. And I'm going to select a default uh, non-physical movement of mouse control. I'm going to edit where he can move with the mouse. And I just simply define it like this. Like this. There we go. Now, of course, the other object that needs to move is the ball. And I'm going to go ahead and select, again, the movement tab. I'm going to give it a bouncing ball movement. Notice that the properties change depending on what option I set. So it's consistently modifying itself to make work easy for you. I'm going to go ahead and select up here for initial direction and make sure that it randomly picks one of those three directions at start. Now keep in mind that I'm using default built-in movements, but you don't have to do that. You can write your own custom everything. It is a programming language in its own right. But again, for ease of use and for uh, the fact that it was asked to see some easier solutions in programming, I'm giving you the bare bones easy treatment. Now, at this point in the classroom environment, I'd say, hey, guys, run your app. And we do that by coming up here and hitting run application or frame, or you can hit one of these shortcut buttons over here. So I'm going to run the frame. We notice the ball flies to the bricks and goes off screen, and I have control over our little chocolate-eating uh, candy dude. Now, of course, the ball is not supposed to fly through the screen, which brings us to our third editor of the evening, the event editor. Programming at its most core, at the most basic, we're giving the machine instructions. And in programming parlance, that the most simplified version of that is if something happens, then do this. So we're going to say if the ball collides with the paddle, Someone in chat, tell me, tell me what the ball should do. Anybody? No, that's that's bounce. There we go. We don't want to blow up the ball. What kind of game are you playing? So we go ahead and bounce the ball. Again, if the ball collides with the brick, right? Or you can uh, be a pro and you can just drag this down, double click it change it to the brick, because that's how the pros do it. We still want the ball to bounce. Everything that you could ask, do, or test for has been broken down into these uh, actions and conditions. And we also want the ball, the brick, to uh, destroy, be destroyed by the ball. 
And then finally, in this very simple example, we're going to test the position of the ball. Is it trying to leave the left top or right of the screen? Again, everything that you could ask, test for, condition against has been broken down into these menus. We still want that ball to bounce. Bounce! So I'm going to run it. And here we are playing our most basic game. And we built it in, what, three, four minutes? So that's not bad. Now, of course, you're saying, oh, great. You you just showed me how to make brick games. Woohoo! You can make as complex of a game as you want in Fusion. Um, for those that are experienced in programming, we have a fourth editor, the event list editor, which shows you your main loop. And if you uh, continue to move along in Fusion, this would also show you your subroutines and, and individual code groups and segments that you shut off and turn on. Pretty much every analogy in uh, regular programming has an equal in Fusion, but it's all done through this drag and drop interface. So what else can I do with this, this, this system, Chris? This seems a pretty basic uh, game you showed me. So I'm going to show you Bit Odyssey. This is something I've been working on for way too long. And it is my version of a procedurally generated No Man's Sky, hopefully with some story. So I'm just going to skip ahead, go to the ship generator, just to show you some functionality. We run it, and oh, that's that's the select race. So you can see here I can generate different races. And then we go here to the ship generator, which is what I wanted to show you. And we've got a ship, and I can change it and make it to whatever I want. All right, I can edit it. And that's an algorithm procedurally generating this ship. Fusion, no, no crazy way of doing it. We just go here, random ship loader, and let's see, that starts at line 94. Better look at the code would be here. And it's all the same type of eventing that uh, I just showed you earlier, just more complex versions of uh, um, uh, eventing. So Zetmill's asking, is there any scripting in Fusion? So a lot of people think that the only way to program, and I'm not saying Zatmill is one of those guys, but um, a lot of people think the only way you can actually program is to write script. Well, I, I, I'm sorry to say that that's not the case. Fusion is just another step and a long line of evolution of programming. We started out with punch cards, then we moved on to, uh, actually before punch cards, we started with uh, vacuum tubes uh, in sequence, and then we moved to punch cards, and then we started writing assembly, and then moved on to scripted languages, and Fusion is just another step in that. So there is no scripting in Fusion. There are a couple objects that developers have added to Fusion that allow you to do uh, some forms of scripting. But um, the idea is to provide an easier to use, closer to the language that we all learned to speak the first time around, method of programming. When it comes to educational value, the beauty of programming in Fusion first is that you develop all the concepts required to master the art of programming, the concepts, the, the processes, the structure. And then when you want to move on to other languages, you don't have to really learn both. You just got to worry about learning the script of the different language. So I hope that answers the question, Zatmel. Thank you. That was so, uh, so that's, that's an example of uh, a more complex version of uh, an app made in Fusion. And you can do pretty much anything in Fusion. Uh, my career has taken me from making small arcade games to uh, you know developing procedurally generated contact games, making Android applications for the oil industry with Fusion. Um, I'm developing a, a game for uh, my good friend at GGDA, and he really needs me to get it done, Noble Armada. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you can do anything with it. So we want to make a game. Uh, together. I hear wrestling. That one I've never done before, so I can do it, but we'll probably be uh, uh, stumbling through it, which I don't mind if you guys don't mind. Are there any other suggestions? Oh, that viewer left. Well, they want to they stick around for a spaceship game. <laughs> All right. Who else wants a spaceship? Asteroids. Okay, asteroids. We'll do that for the next three minutes, and then we'll figure out what else we want to do. Asteroids, file, new. No, I'm not doing FNAF. I'm, I'm sorry. I love Scott. I've known him for 10 years. But I, being working for Click Team, I am so tired of FNAF. So, no, I will not be doing FNAF. My apologies. Uh, great guy, though. Great game. Um, 
Did I just sound like Donald Trump? That's bad. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and make the background black because technically space is black. Um, I can't take a break, guys. Sorry, kids. Okay, have a break. Why are you interrupting this important sorry, business? Well, it's okay. Just stop being scared. Come here. Come here. Come here. Look at everybody and say sorry for interrupting. Sorry. Say it like you mean it. Sorry, darling. All right, thanks. All right. Anyways, send me a send me a, a text. I got kids. If you got kids. All right. So, anyways, we were doing asteroids. Oh, Zap Mill has fur kids. So, does that mean kids who are into furries, or does that mean dogs? I'm assuming dogs. So, let's grab a sprite. Here we go. I'm going to blow through asteroids. You're going to hate me. We're going to make a star because you got to have stars, right? Oh, you guys still can't see the screen? What the heck? Okay. And good. All right. So I made an active. I'll, I'll just do it again. It doesn't take much time. So I made an active right there. I dropped an active by saying insert object. Active. Just like you should in any programming language. Name your stuff. Star. I'm going to double click it. I'm going to get rid of the uh, what we call the blue diamond. It's been a, a uh, click team uh, item for 20 years now. And I'm going to draw the most basic star. There you go. All right? So there you go, star. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to go here. I'm going to say it's start a frame. Fast loop, which is a subroutine. I'm going to say make stars. And I'm going to do it, I don't know, 100 times. And on execution of the subroutine make stars, I'm going to create star. I'm going to set it off screen, barely off screen. And then I'm going to set the position of that star to a random position of frame height or uh, width, and then of frame random frame heights. Did that right? We should see stars. So let's run it. And just like in 2001, it's full of stars. All right. So now we need a ship. So we grab another active object. Go ahead and do that, do that. Draw us a ship. Someone give me a color. I need a color for our, our asteroid ship. Silver. Great. You're the, you're the guy that plays with the colored crayons and always takes the silver and gold crayon, aren't you? All right, so we'll go with gray. Because that's close to silver. I've been Andrew Greenberg. All right. Fill in the spots. And then, I don't know, just for giggles, we need a cockpit. And you can say, well, you know what, Krista doesn't look even. Your art sucks. And I can be like, you're right. So I'll delete it. Copy it, paste it, mirror it, and boom, we've got our ship. No. All right, so there we go. Um, there we go. A minute, uh, our spaceship. Now I'm going to drop it in game, and there we go. Now we got to make the ship move. I'm going to go ahead and, for giggles, I'm going to use the vector movement. I'm going to turn off gravity. Turn off direction. 
for gravity, and I'm going to give it an initial speed of 100. Now I'm going to go here, and I'm going to see that the ship's moving. 100 is probably a bit too fast, so let's lower it down to using bisectional. We'll go to 50 and see if that's good. And, you know, that's even too fast, so let's go 25. We run it. Right. Now, because I use the vector movement, I need an additional object, the click team movement object. And I'm going to grab that here, drop it here. I'm going to do some inventing. I'm going to say repeat. Now, joystick is, is a generic term. So joystick commands can be controlled by actual joysticks or by or gamepads or by the keyboard, depending on what you have set. So repeat while joystick is pressed. If I'm turning the ship that way, then we go here. We say set object to the instance of the ship. Then we go down to vector movement. We say direction. We say rotate object towards angle. We grab the ship's current angle, get direction of this ship. And then we say we'll start with plus one. We're, no, we're, we're minus one because I think we're going the wrong direction. Oh, maybe we're going right. Let's find out. So, and, you know, uh, we'll do that in one degrees. We run it. And it's turning, but barely. So I did something wrong. Here. Uh, make a movie out of fusion. I I don't see why you couldn't. I mean, you're not going to film with it, but you could render your movie, and or you could make. Uh, I, I mean, I guess a good example would be uh, the last Five Nights at Freddy's games, uh, Sister Location. He did some really cool looking three D effects with it when he's not even using three D. Uh, and you know, there's cutscenes and stuff. If you're asking if you can do cutscenes, of course you can do cutscenes. Um, if you're asking to make a movie. The term movie, though, makes me think you're, you're filming a movie, and, you know, Fusion is about writing software. So I don't know if you could, but I don't know if it's the right medium to do so. Sure. Sure. So, um... Yeah, I'm going too fast. Um, all right, so on my mouse, right-clicking pulls up that dialog. And then by left-clicking insert object, I get the object dialog, the object selection dialog. And I've been using actives, which are right here. Actives, again, are uh, synonymous with sprites. Fusion, uh, when dealing in 2D, is a sprite-based engine. And then we have our Firefly objects, which you see down here, which allow you to work in 3D. Uh, the, up here are, are shortcuts to the different editors. So that's the storyboard editor, where we have our storyboard. And then by clicking one, or by clicking one gets you into here and engages the other different uh, Shortcuts. This is the frame editor shortcut, the event editor shortcut, and then the event list shortcut. The event list object shortcut allows you to look at your code in the main loop fashion. Um, that's its biggest advantage. But it's easier to input code here because you can just blow through it in the spreadsheet. Yeah. Hey, folks, uh, it's good, awesome to see that our view count's actually starting to climb up a little bit. And uh, just wanted to pipe in real quick. Hang out. Uh, we are watching Chris Carson uh, creating games in Fusion 2.5. So uh, hang out. Uh, by the end of the stream, we're going to be giving away some codes. Uh, I believe Chris Carson uh, has donated a code for Fusion uh, for one of the paid versions. And also Paladins, if you play the game Paladins by High Res Studios, uh, we we're going to have some game codes to give away. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Please continue, Chris. So anyways, uh, yeah. Um, so right now we're in the event editor again. And from a programming standpoint, this side here is the conditions or if. This side here 
are what we call actions or uh, thens. Uh, we, we train everybody that works with us to get ace on any object. And ace, as I'm going to put here in the chat window, is an acronym for actions, conditions, and expressions. And expressions are the final piece of the puzzle. So I'm going to take us to the expression editor. This is the expression editor. And we build expressions by pulling data from down here and typing stuff in. So let's say I wanted to get a string and make it uh, convert it to uppercase. And then I put my string in here. And then it would take global string A and convert it to all uppercase, whatever the content is. So those are the three major uh, components of Fusion, actions, conditions, and expressions. And the expression editor it pops up whenever you need it. Um, and then finally, the third, fourth and most popular important window is the properties tab, which is right here. If I can get the mouse to work, here you go, properties tab. And you access properties by clicking on various components and you get different properties. And not just objects, but the frame has properties and the application has properties. For instance, in the applications properties, this is where I can determine what my output would be. So we're currently working to build a Windows app, which if we notice has a certain set of objects. But if I was to switch to, let's say, a Android application, I now get only the objects that work for Android. So who does, let's see, Zelda, someone wants me to recreate Zelda. All right, we can, we can give that a shot. So in the same application, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to create a new frame. I'll do that from the storyboard editor. Now, the first thing we need in Zelda in a dungeon is a tiled floor. So I'm going to grab a quick backdrop. I'm going to switch it to motif in the properties. And then we're going to get rid of this X because that doesn't look good. And we'll go with a brown color-ish. With an outline to indicate that it's a tile. And then we'll expand that. Then we'll create a sprite, an active object. And then we're going to go ahead and give him a uh, Zelda looking uh, image. And I'm not a sprite artist, so if my Zelda looks, I mean, my link looks poopy, don't get mad. In fact, I'm telling you, it's going to look horrible. I'm trying to do the theme music in my head right now. Obviously, in Fusion, uh, you wouldn't want to do all your commercial grade uh, art in here. You would find art or have your artist work on art and port it in. But because we're just messing around, we're doing it this way. Uh, I don't know. Let's get ahead on this guy. That is the most impressive looking link art I've seen in the last two seconds. Okay, so open, and then you have your different graphic file types. And then you would simply click on an image. And then you can, you know, port in the whole image. You can import as an animation. And import as an animation will work in such a way that if you have uh, multiple images as a uh, in separate image files in a folder for your animation, it will read those individual numerically sequenced images and s throw them into your frame, uh, your sprites frames. But if you click sprite sheet, you can determine um, how many sprites based on the uh, block size 
And so if I was to do this, it would give me 180 frames. If I was to do it 128 by 128, and then it says I'm going to get 45 frames. So it just cut up that image into 45 equal squares, which obviously isn't our Zelda. Does that answer the question for GGDA? All right. So now we're going to do a movement. And we're going to go with uh, eight directions. And we're going to limit the directions to just up, down, left, right. Now, if I was making my own actual Zelda S game, again, I would use the event editor here to write my own movement code. But, you know, I'm on the spot. So let's go ahead and run it. And now we're walking around like Zelda. Maybe that's a little too fast. We can slow it down. We can slow it down. Like I wish my dog's barking would slow down. All right. We run it again. And of course, when I go backwards, he's walking backwards. That's not a good move. So let's go to the event editor. Say always. And we're going to say scale set angle now fusions active objects are based on uh the animation frames are based on 32 directions so i'm going to say give me the movement direction and i want to multiply that by 11.25 which is the uh individual numbers to fit 32 directions in 360 directions and we want to go for maximum quality Now we've got Zelda walking around. Now we need Octo Rocks. So let's go ahead and grab another sprite, another active object. I'm going to double click to get in. And then we're going to go ahead and do this and make our Octo Rock. Make them high colored purple for contrast on our wonderfully horrible level. Uh, rock. Okay. Label stuff. Okay. Now we can't call him Link because I don't want I don't want to get sued, so we'll call him Zinc. Wonderful. Okay. And then the Octo Rocks. Let's give them a movement. And we could do it like this. We could we go ahead and give them a bouncing ball movement. We can have them randomly determined to go in one of these four directions. Give them a speed. And then we run it, and you see he's moving. Now, of course, he's facing the wrong direction. So we take this code here. We do that. I just dragged it over into the new slot. Double click it and drag that into there. And now it's the same code but works for the Octa Rock. If we run it, you'll see that he's now facing the right way. And then we got to make it look like it's alive. So we'll say every one second, and we'll say one out of three chances, randomize it, say direction, select direction, and we'll again make them randomly pick a direction. So now we run it. And he should change direction. Oh, my God, he's coming after me. Remember, uh, I, I don't remember which developer it was. I, I, I think it was uh, uh, Sigiru Miyamoto who said, uh, it's not the AI you write, it's the AI they think you write. Keep that in mind. Uh, I don't like the fact that our Octorok left the frame, so I'm going to test his position. I'm going to ask if he leaves the left, top, or right. If he does, then I'd like you to go ahead and wrap around the play area, please. And then we need a couple Octo Rocks. Now I got multiple instances of the same object, and I don't want all of them to move at the same time. So I'm going to increase the odds, and I'm going to limit it to pick randomly one Octo Rock. So now I've made a multi conditional statement. I'm going to run it, and they should randomly change directions. There you go. No, 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 no. That's Mario. 
Get, so, someone sing some uh, Zelda music for us. I know we can't hear you, but all right. Now, uh, of course, Link. I'm sorry, Zinc is carrying the uh, instead of the Master Sword. What is he carrying? He's carrying the the Disaster Sword. So let's draw our sword. Thank you, thank you, Casey. Thank you. All right. So here's our garbage sword that we're doing. That's feeling epic already. Now I'm going to copy that. I'm going to loop it. And I started with purple. So in the in the uh, interest of honoring our computer forefathers, I'm going to go with CGA colors. Oh, that one should be white. Loop it. That's what it's going to look like. And then we go ahead and we leave it up here. OK. And then we go here and we say when the joystick presses button one, then launch the sword in the direction of zinc. Again, we got to name the sword. Instead of the master sword, it's the disaster sword. And if I did it right, it should shoot the sword. Let's test it. Now, notice again that when I shoot in this direction, the sword's still facing me. So we got to run that same code up here and change it. So now we're shooting the sword out. You guys think the sword's moving too fast? Yes, I've got a one yes. So let's slow the sword down. We adjust that by going here. And we'll go half speed. We run it again. Yeah, much better. All right. Now we got to get rid of the Octorox. So if the sword collides with the Octorock, then destroy the Octorock. Run it. Now I should destroy the sword too. So destroy here. All right. Are are you uh, live right now with me? So Brian's going to get on live and ask a question. Yep, sorry about that, folks. I forgot I didn't turn my mic back on. All right, so uh, I was asking, Chris, if um, uh, Fusion has any built-in animations, for instance, when he destroys the Opterock or something along that lines. That's a great question. So absolutely, we go here. And again, in the picture editor, you'll see all these different animation slots, right? And when I give, for instance, the destroy command, I can copy this guy, put it here, and then I can do that and maybe go with the whole, it goes white, then it goes gray, and then it goes dark gray, I said dark gray, and then we go black. So let's see if that works. Let's run it. Oh, I missed. No good. Boom. That answered the question, my good friend. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you want to use library graphics, then you can get that all here in the library if you want to expect, you know, have something to play with. Um, but I mean, guys, let's 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 think about it. It doesn't take much art-wise to get into the end of the game market now these days. Uh, we can make particle effects real quick. And we don't even have to have complete. Uh, we don't have to have uh, that much of a complex thing. So I could just make a particle, 
We'll go with uh, the same color scheme that the sword has. And we could change the color. White, right? Lopets. I created it off screen, so it's in that area of the, the frame editor that's considered backstage. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that it doesn't create its start. Now, I'm going to do one extra thing just for ease. I'm going to create this, this adject, active object here. I'm going to call it the placer. Leave it right there. I'm going to make sure that it's invisible at all times. And then on our collision event over here on the event editor, position. Select position where the Octorock is. I'm going to put that above. I'm going to copy, remove here, and I'm going to remove this here. Oh, that was the wrong one. I'm going to remove that. And I'm going to do another fast loop or subroutine. Make particles. Copy that. Let's say 10 times and I'm going to say on loop or on subroutine create our particle to our placer and then I'm going to say here I'm going to give it a movement I haven't given the particle a movement and for ease I'm just going to go with bouncing ball and then here now the way fusion works is if I look at this line here I've created an object. So in Fusion's object selection routine, if there are multiple versions of those objects, the only one that I'm able to manipulate moving forward in this event would be this single instance. So I don't have to worry about changing other particles in the, uh, in the line, only this instance of that particle. So kind of an important trick to know about Fusion. I want to set the speed to be random, 20, Plus 10. And then we don't want the particles laying around. So we're going to say compare speed of the particle. Is it lower than 2? It is destroy the particle. We got to make sure we add some deceleration in the properties. And I run it. And we try to kill something. Boom, particles. Get out of here. And, you know, people might be like, well, that's not enough particles, Chris. Okay, friend, we'll make more particles. So let's say 50 and let's see what that looks like. Get out of here. There you go. All right, guys, what's next? Particles for all. All right, well, um, I guys appreciate you listening. If you have any more questions, um, Feel free to reach out to me. I'm going to give you some links right now to keep track of that you can reach me at. I'm the one who answers all the mail for these links, starting with Twitter, Facebook, and we recently started our own patron service for professional developers and folks who want some inside stuff. That's a work in progress page. Any comments are welcome on it. And, uh, you know, we got 10 minutes. You got any questions? I'd love to answer them. Okay. Great question. How would I install a power up? So you could, you know, we could do this. We could say, how would you change stats again? Well, let's start with the power up. So on this line here, we're automatically shooting stuff, right? So I could set a global value that says, we'll call it uh, uh, sword beam switch. Then we add an additional condition here. And we say compare to global value. Is sword beam switch equal to one? So now I can't shoot unless I have the one. And then we can take this, clone it, maybe make it bigger. 
Sorry. Come on, mouse. Make it bigger. Rotate it. Right? And then I could just put that over here. And then I could say, if player collides with the power up, then set the global value of power up to one, and then get rid of said power up. So, hey, that's asteroids. Get out of here. And then, uh, so I can't shoot. I'm trying to shoot. Then I grab the power up, and now I can shoot. Die. Die, ghetto, Aka Rock. Okay, so that's, uh, hope that answers the question. Anybody else have questions? Well, that's, I mean, it's just like any programming language. In Fusion, uh, you have your global values and your global strings uh, where you store data. Uh, in objects, you also have values and strings. You also have Boolean, which we call flags. So you can set on and off or toggle. Um, so you can manipulate your stats there. I could say this guy has health. He has 100 health. I could grab a, just for giggles, a counter object. Move my background back into place. Change that counter object to a, instead of a number, make it a horizontal bar. Set the color to green. Put it up here. And then I could say, always execute this all the time. Set the counter to the hero's health. And then I could say, whenever the hero collides with an octo rock, subtract from health, five, and let's go get some damage. Not very noticeable. So the reason why that's not working, debugging, is because I didn't establish my minimum and maximum values here. So as soon as I set this to zero for minimum, I set that to 100 maximum. Now we should see some results. Oh, see, there goes the health. And then, of course, when you're done with that, you can store the data temporarily in those different variables I showed you. You can store them in list objects. Uh, you can build your own INI files, your own arrays, um, pretty much anything. So does that answer the question? All right, I'm going to hop in the mic. Here we go. There we go. Now you can hear me. Um, there was another, there was several good questions, but um, one asked, uh, Casey asking, how do you change levels or rooms? Okay, so it depends how you want to do it. It's programming. You can do it any, any billions of ways. We could uh, do the whole room slide bit, and that's a little tricky. We would have to first take our frame and make it larger. So let's just make this 2,000 by 2,000. So now if we hit enter, oh, sorry, I wanted to do the frame. That's here, 2,000 by 2,000. So now you'll see that I still have a, um, oh, come on, what are you doing? Uh, sorry. No, okay. So you'll now see that I have, this dotted line represents the viewport into the game. That's what I can see when I run the game. This extra white space is more level. So let's go ahead and clone this. Let's change the color so we know we're doing something different. So that's different. And then the first step would just be to track the camera. But we can't do that because Zelda, you have to walk through the door, right? So let's make a door real basic. Get a, a black wall, maybe. I'm going to do this. Uh, 
Okay. Now we know that this frame is 640 by 480. So our, our, our Y value for halfway is 320. And so what we do is we, I did that wrong. I need to go down to here and then make another one. And then I could say, I could do a camera tracker, set that to the middle. So that's uh, 320 by 240. And then we do a condition, test position of zinc. Is he trying to leave the, how are we going to do that? I'm having to figure it out as we go. So let's compare Y position. Is he trying to go lower or greater than 640 by 480? Make an always statement up here. And I say position, sorry, scrolling, sent window, center here, almost there. If Y position is greater than 480, then value add to, I'm sorry, position, set Y, get Y, add five. But I only want it to do it. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm just banging through it just to, to illustrate. We want to make sure that the Y value is still lower than, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, lower than, so we got 240. We're talking, we'll say 745. Search position Y is lower than 700. That should do it. Now, if I did everything right, it should run. Let's find out. Mario again. There you go. So that's just a very basic, very, very basic uh, example. And you probably want to code it differently than I just did. But that illustrates how you could do it. Next question. Text speech. Okay. So, well, we can do it a lot of ways. Um, if we want to type it out like in Zelda does, let's get our display string. Let's give it a color that we can see. Blue, maybe. No. Green. Yeah. Let's make it bold. Okay. And we put that here. Okay. Then we're going to have another string which is going to be the string that we load our actual text in. Where's my string objects? There you go. Hi. I am a cheap ripoff of Zelda. Okay. So now we got the text and we got a display string. So I'm here. The very first thing I'm going to do is start a frame is the display string, I'm going to set its alterable string to nothing. Then, new event, every, I don't know, couple seconds. Uh, let's make it 50 of a second. I'll need a value, so I'm going to declare a global value. I'm going to call it text counter. I'll set that to 1. We'll set it to zero. Then we'll add here. Add to text counter one. Then we go over to the display text. And we say change alterable string. Left the string with the text that we want to display. And we do it any number of characters. If I did it right, it should run. Here we go. Too slow, let's speed it up. We're running it again. There you go. And he's right, he is a cheap rip off of Zelda. So he's got that going for him. Does that answer the question? All right. 
So yeah, follow those links uh, for me if you are still interested. Give me a, a personal uh, email message. I would love to answer any questions that you have on Steam. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, on Fusion. And uh, maybe the good folks at GGDA will invite us back. Okay. Uh, hey, it would help if uh, I turned my microphone on. Yes, technology. We got to love it. Hey, there's Chris. This is the voice behind the, the screen that you've been hearing all night long. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Uh, thank you again, Chris Carson, for fusion uh, blowing our minds <laughs> and how fast you can make some games. You are very well uh, rehearsed in fusion. Um, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned uh, throughout tonight's stream, we do have some prizes to give away, but first, you know what happens, right? Uh, I've got to run my mouth for a little bit. <laughs> All right. Um, TGDA, live Patreon. As soon as we end this stream, you're going to get to see our commercial, but we do have a live Patreon. Um, we are a nonprofit organization, so your support will help us with efforts to improve game developers and their community, as well as helping to bring better games to life. Our stream is for gamers looking to get, learn more about what goes into their favorite games, and uh, it's also for new designers looking to break in. It's also for experienced designer, designers looking to improve their skills. Still haven't learned to talk. You've been doing all the talking tonight. <laughs> all right. Uh, next announcement. Uh, if you are in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, the first weekend of October, you should come to Siege. We are have our keynote speaker, Jesse Shell, Fantastic art teacher, dad. Come to Atlanta, come to Siege. Throw up the link. There you go. Thank you, GGDA. Also, as I mentioned earlier, we are a nonprofit organization, so we do have some merchandise on Cafe Press. Um, <clears throat> we have coffee cups. We have T-shirts. They give you boost for your game development. That's right. You know, the coffee will give you more intellect. The shirt will give you more stamina. And I'll think of some other silly things to do next time. All right. Uh, also, if you are a GGDA member or a TAG member, our next meeting in Atlanta is on August 8th. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, game studios and uh, the building of your game studio. So every game studio, no matter how successful, was once a startup. Many fall by the wayside, often without ever releasing a single game. Hopefully nobody here on this stream is falls in that category. So what are the qualities that make a studio a success? More important, how can you ensure that yours is going to be one of them? So join our panel of industry insiders and experts as we go over the factors that can lead a studio to success. And so that meeting is going to be here in Atlanta, August 8th. Next, uh, if you like what we're doing here on the stream, uh, we do have VODs that will be down below at the bottom of the stream available for you. But if it uh, – Mixer takes them away after a while. So we upload these videos back into YouTube so that you can watch them at any given time. So if you like games, you like game development, check out our YouTube channel. We've got tons of videos uh, and follow us along. And next, we got to give a special thanks to Antlion Audio. Um, you're going to see their commercial here in just a minute for some amazing microphones that they've got. But uh, through them, we are have a 10% off all mods and mics uh, and Antlion accessories. You just got to simply use the code GGDA. Now, this special ends on September 4th, so act now, act fast, right, and just act on it. All right. What did I say? I said I was going to give away some prizes. We have 138 viewers. I saw it get up to 150 at one point. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And it is time to do a giveaway. Um, for our Paladins players, uh, thank you to Hi-Res Studios sponsoring this stream. Uh, let's see here. What can I give you? What would you like? <laughs> Chris is disappearing off the screen. What, you want to see my pretty face? Here you go. Look, I'll take over. You're no longer visible, Chris. Um, let's see. The wreck chest. I want to give away a wreck chest. That's right. I'm going to spell it out for you. R-E. Uh, K T. Yes, -T. All right. That's what I'm going to give away. A wreck chest for paladins. All right. You guys ready for this? Let's see what happens. Giveaway in. Yeah, you guys must talk. I know I didn't say anything about that right off the bat. Let me turn this off. There we go. All right. Giveaway. Ready? Here we go. Three, two, one, and Deadstream6664. Hey, congratulations. Hang out. Um, and I will link you to 
uh, your code here in just a minute. But first, let me do the next giveaway. Chris has been very kind and generous to donate uh, the uh, paid version of two point Fusion 2.5 Standard Edition. All right? So you've been watching tonight's stream. You, you like Fusion? You, do, you want to get just a little bit more than the free version? Yes, it, and it's on Steam, by the way. All of these codes are for Steam. So let's do another giveaway for Fusion 2.5 Standard. And the winner is Albedo Grace. Congratulations, Albedo Grace. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, our winners, please hang out. I will be giving you your codes here shortly. All right. And thank you once again, everybody. Thank you, Chris. And we will see you again soon. All right. Good night, everybody. Are you tired of your streams or voice chats sounding like this? Do you want the comfort and quality of the high-end headphones without sacrificing microphone quality? Antline's Mod Mic 5 is the perfect solution. Their dual capsule microphone attaches easily and securely to your existing headphones and fits within any setup thanks to the modular cable system. It comes with a cable wrap to protect your wires and optional inline mute switch and sends a little something like this. The link in the video description to learn more. Thank you for your interest in the Georgia Game Developers Association's Patreon campaign. The Georgia Game Developers Association is a nonprofit that focuses on educating both game developers and fans on what is involved in making great games. For years we have put on live events to do just that, attracting some of the greatest thinkers in game development to share their secrets. Recently, we began our live streaming channel on Mixer to expand our ability to reach those developers and gamers far beyond our state. We have seen some initial success, but we are also hearing a lot of requests for more. More workshops, more in-depth interviews, more first looks at indie games, more giveaways, and more great streams. Your support will allow us to do just that. Even at starting levels, we both recognize your support and seek your input on what to stream. At higher levels, you can actually help shape our content, gaining priority access to our speakers, the chance to share announcements, and, at the highest level, running ads and promotions for all our viewers to see. So join now to get the inside scoop on game development and to help shape one of the best game dev channels on the net.